The content you're about to enjoy comes from the archives of The Best You. We're devoted to the very best in personal development, with a platform and resources dedicated to inspiring and changing people's lives. At The Best You, we work with the world's leading writers and trainers on the evolution of the self and people whose journeys have been affected by their work and words. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co. Hi, I'm Bernardo Moya, and welcome to Inspiring People. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing uh, Derek Mills, who is a speaker, author, and also a very successful businessman. Hi, Derek. How are you? Bernardo. Very good, thank you. Very thank good you for being here today. Thanks for having me. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where were you born and where were you brought up and your early years? Well, I'm actually uh, from Birmingham, originally. Mm-hmm. Uh, I live out in Worcestershire now, but... Um, my parents came to the UK uh, when, my, when they were children with their parents. Um, I had seven kids and I'm child number five. <laughs> and so, so it's uh, so a big family and, you know, went to a normal comprehensive school in Birmingham. One of the challenges of my, of my life um, it was with the point that when my mother died when I was 13, I remember getting home from school one day and one of the neighbours bursting in just to announce on the spot that she'd died that day. And, of course, when you're 13, how do you react to that? Well, for me, um, apart from the normal trauma, emotional trauma, I lost my voice. I found that I couldn't speak. Um, and I couldn't speak for about two weeks after that. I then went back to school. Um, when I went back to school, the very first day, I, I spoke with a stutter. Never had a stutter before, and I stammered and stuttered and spluttered. And that stayed with me right through my youth into my early 20s, and then I figured out a way to resolve that into my mid to late 20s. And, th- and that was the, my early early story, just as an ordinary guy with a stutter. And so before that, how, how was school for you? Or well, uh, Before the stats, I mean. Yeah, I, I enjoyed school, and I was a typical typical lad, um, relatively bright at school. So, uh, the kind of, in fact, uh, you know, the kind of child that annoys teachers, where they would shout at you, what are you doing? And you'd go, well, well the work's done. So that made them more annoyed, didn't it? <laughs> so, uh, so uh, OK, no, it's typical, uh, not, not a naughty lad, just highly spirited, a bit chatty, <laughs> and, and, uh, and got to a place where, in the end, I found the teachers that loved me, and, uh, and they really did help me in those early years, and particularly after the event. I had some great mates at school, some of which I'm still in contact with now. With social media. Yeah, yeah, social, through social yeah, yeah, media. Yeah, yeah, through social media. Found a few friends, happy old friends, friends, and they found me. It's, it's absolutely marvellous yeah. to see how people have changed and what's happening for them. And some of them are reading my book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right now. <laughs> so, uh, in the, any subjects in particular that you stood out that yeah. you really enjoyed? I loved English. Yeah. And, I, and I, um, you know, you have that favourite teacher at school that mm. you know that absolutely loves you. And even though you might be the, the naughty lad, not that I was naughty, of course, in the other subjects, I adored English language, English literature, and my teacher there was Mrs Pearson. And God bless her, you know, she did, she supported me and when other teachers would reject me and she just said, come on in. And she's the one that got me to win the the top English prize in the whole school by the time I left the school. That was because of her support and her confidence in me. So loved English and things like physics. I still enjoy physics and not just metaphysics, but (laughs) physics, physics and mechanical physics. So, yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So after you got the stutter and then yeah. you, you obviously went through a difficult patch, mm. what happened then? Well, 25, um, a young lady really brought it home to me that I couldn't speak properly. She tried to humiliate me with a letter telling me that I couldn't speak and that I babbled incoherently. And But I made a decision in that moment, and that was the key thing, say, from this moment onwards. Now, she's right, by the way. Forget her intent. We can do that in life, can't we? Forget the intent, but take the message. And the message was, I couldn't speak properly, so I learned to speak properly for the second time. I went to see a speech therapist about breathing. I went on a 14-week speaking course. I didn't go on a stuttering course. <laughs> I didn't want to be a stutterer. I went on a speaking course. In fact, Dale Carnegie, you're familiar with yeah, Dale yeah. Carnegie Works. I went on a 14-week program uh, with Dale Carnegie. And by the end of that 14 weeks, I and the breathing exercise that I was doing and the slowing things down my mind and the confidence, you know, I developed that to about 30. And by 30, you wouldn't have called me a stutterer. So wow. that was the end of that. And I didn't become a speaker, of course, until I was in my mid-40s. <laughs> but, by, uh, you know, but by 30, I was an ordinary guy who uh, spoke quite normally. 
So it took you quite a few years to overcome completely your... Well, yeah, I mean, until about 25 to 30, it took me till that point to overcome it, but I didn't do anything with it. I just, you know, as a self-employed, you know, financial services person, and... Um, and business wasn't good. <laughs> Max business was pretty poor until I was about 38. You know, I'm a late developer. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I get there, I get there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it's uh, age 38, I'm still struggling you know, to pay the bills and working six days a week and, you know, um, not seeing my wife and family and all that usual stuff. Let, let me take you back. So yeah. when, when you when you eventually finished school, yep. what was your first job? First job I had was... Um, Wow, I worked in an ice cream factory. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I worked in a couple of factories, in fact. I worked in an ice cream factory just for doing this really technical job where you had to just get the container, put it under, put the ice cream in, put the lid on, put it on a pallet. That was my first job. And then I worked as a, worked in a, a cafe, frying burgers. I worked as a, a security guard. Um, sometimes at building sites, other times in outside offices, and other times in shops. And I think the real breakthrough, if you want to call it, to a proper job, well, they're not proper jobs, but what my dad would have called a proper job um, was when I got a, a job working as a civil servant. I was a clerical officer. And I have this um, this claim to fame within the civil service. I worked for the DSS, um, then called the DHSS, went in as a clerical officer, which is one level above the bottom. And I was so bad at doing that job, I got demoted to the lowest level. And apparently <laughs> they'd never heard of anyone <laughs> that came in at that level and got demoted to the bottom level. And um, what was funny about that is that, um, well, it wasn't funny then, by the way, <laughs> so it's humiliating, but what happened is, is then is that um, just as I got demoted and the whole building, it seemed everyone in the region was talking about this, someone's got demoted, it never happened before, is my, um, my first girlfriend from school joined the DSS in the same office oh, and she heard how well I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, hey, stuff happens, doesn't it? We rise, <laughs> we rise above them. <laughs> so uh, so eventually that you, you got yourself into financial services? Yeah, I got myself into financial services and you know what, it's one of those industries where you can really do well, make a difference in people's lives and if you do that enough, you get to do well for yourself. Um, but I couldn't figure it out, you know, 21, even before I got over the stuttering issue, I wasn't very good anyway, to be fair. You know, I could blame the stutter. Mm-hmm. And what I did do, funny thing, I remember when I was in the early days and when I was one-to-one with someone with a new client, because I had this speech impediment, I would imagine that they would have to pay more attention to me and kind of lean in and pay more attention because <coughs> because of the way I spoke. And because they were leaning in and paying more attention, I kind of imagined that I could sell them easier, become a client easier. I don't know. I got myself through that. And, of course, it was uh, at 25 when the, um, the letter came from this young lady that told me I couldn't speak properly and she couldn't get a job with the company that I worked at. And she wrote to me and said, you know, I um, can't believe that you're working at the company when someone... Um, the way she couldn't get the job, and she had said in her letter, and someone like you, Mr. Mills, who can't even speak properly, and I quote, and who babbled incoherently, <laughs> can be working at the company and I can't, because she'd had these great qualifications. You know what? Um, that was a learning curve for me and a change, but it didn't change my financial position, because between 25 and 30, I learned how to speak again, but I realised I still couldn't do the job very well. <laughs> between 30 and 38, um, I was married four children by that point, and six days a week, 10 o'clock at night, getting home at 11. Disaster. And Sorry, sorry were you working for a financial company? You, yeah, working, you, for, was, working for two different financial firms over, over my career, but self-employed. So yeah. no one's paying, you know, if I, if I don't work, I don't earn any, any income, no, don't eat, you know, how do you pay the bills? And, uh, you know, everyone's got their story. Mm-hmm. And that story sometimes make us in terms of who we are today in the moment. Um, but, you know, I got, went through a place where wife and four children, my wife wasn't working, but that was our decision for her to stay at home, look after the children, um, save the house from foreclosure, going to court, sitting down with the district judge to convince him that this one time I will definitely pay the, pay the outstanding mortgage. So I didn't have to go home and tell my wife because she had no idea how bad things had got. She did know a few years later, however, when um, the bailiffs came to the house <laughs> to, uh, from the council tax to value you know, what we had in the house. So if I didn't pay the bill within seven days, that they would come and take it. And that kind of um, embarrassment was completed because um, my in-laws were visiting from Ireland that same day. And they were in the house and the bailiffs turned up. So um, it's a great start to my career. <laughs> so, uh, so that was my life, six days a week until 38. And uh, then I woke up. No, no th- you can still wake up at 38, which is the great news, isn't ne- it? Never too late. Yeah. Absolutely. It's 83. Wake up. Yeah. Never too late. Yeah. So this was your turning point. Yeah. And, uh, and this is kind of the, the beginning of your journey. Tell, tell me how it, yeah. how it happened. 
Well, you know the, the thing where when you get to 38 and you're not seeing your loved ones and you're working six days a week, for me that led to obviously, you know, just, just about paying the bills and robbing Peter to pay Paul and also um, what I call near depression. I say near depression because I wouldn't go to the doctor to get the diagnosis. But you know when you know, don't you, when you're really, really in a, in a bad place. But one night I'm in the office and the... It's about, I don't know, quarter to 10, 9.30 in the evening. And the office security guard came in and he just said to me, he said, um, no, time to like up. I'm always the last one there, you know, all the guards on the business park know that. My car's always the last one there. Um, and I said, just give me 10 more minutes. And then he walked away again and I shuffled some more bits of paper. Who am I going to call tomorrow? Who's on my prospect list and all that kind of stuff? He came back and I asked some more time. And then he said to me, you know, what time did you get in this morning? And that one question from the guy I called my first coach, um, changed the whole of my life. That one question made me stop, pause, and go inside and honestly, for the first time in my life, go inside and ask, is this my life? Is this even me? I'm not happy. Um, I'm depressed. I'm broken. In fact, this isn't my life. And the message that came from that place, you can't be happy as not you. And I made some decisions in that place and some of the stuff I'd held on to for almost 20 years... I, have, I threw them out in that moment because the voice that inside that spoke to me was actually my voice. And the great thing about that first 10 second moment where these concepts came to me is I recognised the voice as being my authentic voice. The next part was even more important. I followed through on the messages and the guidance that came from that place and that's what made all the difference. And that was kind of where you came up with the 10 second philosophy, which, Indeed. Is, which is your book. Indeed. So give us kind yeah. of the, the guidelines, the foundations of, of the yeah. 10 second philosophy. Yeah, it's called the 10 second philosophy because um, my epiphany, if you want to call it that, um, came in about 10 seconds. And I realised actually that after all the years of struggling, then in fact, that life wasn't mine. It had been me following what I thought the world, the clients, the business industry would have me be. And in that 10 seconds, I realised that um, actually that I was a genius. And I, I, know, I know now that we're all geniuses, but I was, I was actually a genius, and the stuff that's inside of me could come and revolutionise my life if I got it outside of me. So one of the things that came to me in that moment was to... Um, you know, I'm the guy that had been setting you know, the goals you know, for 17, 18 years. And for 17, 18 years, I got to 38 years, and I was still broken depressed. I'd done the goals thing, I'd read the books, and done some courses, still broken depressed. So one of the things that came to me was that uh, goals alone don't work. You know, there's something missing. And what came out of me was actually there was something else. And I discovered what's called the golden link. Now, think about the chain of the goals being, uh, being there. And the golden link is something called standards. Not just standards, however, but daily standards. One of the gifts that came out of me was that standards, uh, effectively, the def definition that came to me was a standard is a basis, criteria, level, quality or rule basis criteria and level quality rule that you set from within, from your truth, and you commit to living from that place just for today. Not for three weeks or three years or 30 years or a 30-year business plan, just for today. So even if you have goals into that distant future, is we achieve our goals and we interact with the world and we engage with the world and the world engages with us based on the standards that we set. So if we engage and set our standards here, that's where we meet the world. When we set them here, the world meets us here. And that's what I realised in that moment. So I began to live by these standards and set new standards around which clients I would see, their income, their, their, their wealth. That I set new standards around my business parameters. I wouldn't go and drive anywhere around the country anymore, doing hundreds of miles each day. All clients must come to me. Um, that's interesting when you call lots of prospective clients you've been trying to do business with and you just tell them, oh, by the way, I'd like to have another meeting with you, but you must come to me. I'm no longer offering to come and see you. Some of them turn up just out of curiosity. <laughs> that's, that's what I found. Some of them did. And the others just go, he's lost it. But uh, the key thing is that uh, I began to live by these standards, my business, in my health, standards on my family time, taking kids to school, being there, no more working weekends, no more evening appointments. I went from six days, double full time, to working three and a half days part time. My income, which is the thing that people take, saw first, went up by 12 times in three years. And from being a struggling person at this organisation to a senior partner, I made the first million within three years. The following year, I made a million dollars in just that year, and that was 2007. So what I realised after all these years, if unless we engage and set standards from our truth, from within, so we're consistent with them, so that we are congruent with them, having all the goals in the world will just keep you thinking, one day, I'll be happy one day when I get this weight, income, house, car, job, one day. Tomorrow doesn't come. 
happiness is a now experience. And if happiness is a now experience, we need to structure ourselves to remain in the now and live my truth in the now. That's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so from where you were, Derek, uh, mm. whereby, you know, you had this epiphany moment mm. and, and then you decided to revalue everything. Mm. Um, how, long, how long was that? Um, <laughs> that's a great question because, you know, um, this happened to me in November 2003. And uh, I reset these standards that first night, November 2003. In fact, I'll into a little secret here, I, I wrote out some new standards. My, my, I have this thing called Perfect, seven areas of life that you can set standards in that changes, change all of your life. Because any one thing affects everything else. So your personal health and fitness, your environment, relationships, family, emotions, career, and time. Now for me, and everyone's different, I chose three key areas at that time, which was my health, family, and my career, my business. I set new standards in all of those areas, and that first night, I wrote them down. Um, I created a timetable to see how I would live those things out, as in each day was a different day, and how I would live them in the day. I color-coded them, I laminated them, <laughs> At those first early standards, I gave a copy to each of my children, the three that were there at the time, and a copy to my wife. I put a copy on the fridge with a fridge magnet, and I said, new dad, new husband, new everything, new standards. This is me from this moment onwards. And from that day, I began to live myself as my truth. If you're interested in working with me, contributing to the magazine, maybe speaking at any of our many events around the world, partnering or licensing the best you, Go to www.thebestyou.co. Um, well, as you said, I mean, you, yeah. you managed to triple your 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 income. Sorry, you, twelve times your income yeah. in three in three years. Yeah, indeed. Um, doing the same job. Doing and the same that, I think job. people sometimes say that, well, oh yeah, you, I changed jobs. I became an author. I did this. I no, I did exactly the same job in the same building with the same product products. Self employed for the same organisation and and using the same same everything. <laughs> I changed, not the things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and I wanted to ask you, so I know you still do what you do now, but mm -hmm. you decided then to eventually write the book and mm -hmm. then put the 10-second philosophy. When was that? Yeah. Um, well, funny thing is, from, from around 2008, business got, exploded so much, I actually went on a business course with an international uh, organisation of entrepreneurs that kind of taught you how to manage your business better. Because <laughs> I couldn't, it was just like, Poof, how do I manage all this now? Different, different problem, but still a problem. Um, after the, I won't mention the course, it wouldn't be fair to, but after a year of the course, I realised actually a lot of people on the course were looking for some of the solutions that I'd found for myself, and they were telling me, Jerry, could you help me with that? Help me with that. By the end of the course, someone said to me, um, love the way you've put input into this programme. I said, by the way, I'm leaving, because for me it's not about more processes, it's about being me and being my truth. And he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I know someone who's a literary agent. And I um, and would love to bring your story and your methodology and your philosophy to a publisher. I'm sure they'd like you. So we had a lunch, one lunch. They introduced me to the publisher, one publisher. And they said, yeah. And that was it. That's how I got the book published. Because prior to that and, and since that point, I'd been mentoring people, coaching, and, you know, doing little uh, workshops for people. I think the one thing that I realised, people didn't turn up because they saw me being happier, balanced, centred, and there, there's no gaze. And how, how's happy is Bernardo today? How do you, how'd you, how'd you share that on a scale of one to ten? People turned up because they saw the, the change in my life. Mm. They saw things that happened, kids into private school. Um, I always wanted to play polo. Don't ask me, not now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I couldn't even ride a horse, you know, yeah. when, when, I, when, I, when I had that feeling. But I knew when I saw a game that I, I wanted to you do that. You look good playing polo. Uh, well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, so I started playing polo, had lessons, and before I sort of, I've still got a, I've still got a pony left um, that I haven't sold yet, but I then had my own polo team up until a couple of years, about three years ago now, um, put the kids into private education, all these things. People began to say, well, but you're that guy that when there were a thousand agents working for it, so when there are 1,200 agents working for the company, you were a thousandth on the list. Okay, how come now that the company is 1,600 strong that you're 28th on the list? How have you done that in three years and become a senior partner? Um, so people began to ask the questions and I didn't actually know all the answers. And I still don't know all the answers. What I do know is when I stop and go inside, 
that truth and those answers come out. And that's why I realised I'm a genius, because I went into other things, you know, film production. We won a film, uh, produced a film, which won an, won an award at um, the PAFF Best Short Film in 2012. We were screened at Raindance, um, which is just short of winning anything. But, you know, it's the next best thing, being screened at Raindance, because thousands of entrants, of course. Um, and I found out I could speak and do other things, and, of course, found that I could write because of the book. What I'm saying here is that when we take time to access the resources on the inside, there's far more there than, A, we could ever set a goal about because we don't know what's there, and that, B, that could revolutionise our lives in a way that nothing else can because we came here with all those gifts, and it's about finding the practical way day by day to get your gifts out into the world, and what, will, what you'll discover, you'll revolutionise your life, and maybe even the world. So once you publish the book, mm-hmm. and obviously you've done very well in business now, mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of obviously what, what you're talking about, mm-hmm. and I understand the standards, and, mm-hmm. and I, I think we've discussed how we should see ourselves as brands, and, mm-hmm. and you know, I ask people, what kind of brand are you? You know, are you a cheap a shampoo in, mm-hmm. in, in the sales department, <laughs> or, or, or are you premium yeah, yeah. champagne? Absolutely. And, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I understand uh, the standards. Explain to me in a little bit more detail what you uh, we'll talk about how you're doing research with mm-hmm. big brands and, yep. and and modeling their standards yeah, indeed but what are the standards the, yep. the perfect that you were talking okay. about okay so what we're looking at is when, when i began to work with people remember i was the, the first guinea pig i'd never heard this stuff before it just came out when i began to work with other people what i noticed was that um see most people have got no idea that they've run their life based upon standards so let's remember remind ourselves what a standard is it's a basis criterion level quality or rule that we set from within and we live our lives by by the day what people realize when we have the conversation with them is that they're already living running their lives by standards but they're not aware of them because so what so why do you do this in terms of your social behavior in terms of your drinking in terms of the clients that you see or the the way that you whatever it might be the way that you allow someone to treat you in a relationship well well, I did that when I was 21 and I worked for this company and they always did that. So we always went drinking and eat, ate deep fried Mars bars on a Friday night after 17 pints. So, but you're 41 now. So where did that standard come from? I consider the source. I began to work out, which is for myself and then for others, is to consider the source of the standards, the rules, the qualities, the levels, the criteria, the basis we run our lives by in the seven key areas and make, and have this, make a decision. Where did that source, what, what was the source of that standard, should I say? And does that standard still serve me now? Consider the source, does it serve me now? And then, of course, there are a lot of things you can do to release and let go of the standard no longer serve you. And you can put, set in force new standards, because nature abhors a vacuum. You can put in place new standards that can serve you your truth now, consciously. Because you do have them. Everyone has a standard around a relationship, you know, around the health and the food that they eat. You know? And for me, the health thing, because I had stress and near depression, I was never actually depressed, remember that. I was just clinically unhappy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but when you have you know, issues around you, who, how you're eating and you're not exercising and the wrong foods, well, where did that come from? Where did, well, friends, society, TV, the media, and when I was 21, okay, you're not 21 anymore. Are these standards honouring and serving you now? And in doing so, do they, do they allow you to honour and serve others? Because to the degree that you can honour and serve others and yourself, the world will reward you in a massive way that you can't even work out yet. So set some standards based on who you truly are. You can go through CBT, use some NLP techniques, you can use all types of patterns to get rid of those. Tapping, if you're into tapping, you can do all these things to get rid of those old models and old standards and, and rules. Set new ones that reinforce you. And this is where... I began to get excited because of the commitments I made in that moment when I first had this revelation. There's a, when I set a standard for myself, no matter what it is in my health, my business, my relationship, my family, whatever it is, I'm only going to do it today. That's my commitment. I'm going to stick to this standard just and put, put, until I put my head back on my pillow tonight. Not for a day long. This isn't about a week or for the month or the year. Just for today. Stick at this standard. A client turns up, the wrong quality client for me, I'll redirect them to somebody else. That food is served, which is not going to serve my body. Don't eat that. Just for today, not forever. No, just for today. Um, relationships where people are you know, in abusive relationships, where people are have friends that don't honour them, get, got them going the wrong way. Now look, look at our friendships. I had to do this and say, look at my friends now. Not as a judgment, but this is my life. What have they? What have my friends got me doing? 
What have they got me saying? Where have they got me going? And do those standards actually honour and serve me? And in doing so, do they allow me to honour and serve other people? If the answer is no, that being honest, going inside and saying, okay, so what's right for me? And setting new standards from that place. And the only commitment is for today. Tomorrow, hey, if the good Lord gives you another day, you re recommit your standards just for that day. So there's no more pressure, no more three uh, stuff. It's just by the day. Yeah. That's the practical side of standards. And if you're in business, it's a massive thing because you can decide when you open up a business, you can decide who comes over the threshold. You can make a decision about who you serve through how you serve and what you serve determines who you serve. And the world would engage you based on the standards that you set. So that's how I got to stay in the same business by saying, actually, same products, services and company and same building, same office. But actually, I need to make sure that the people I work with understand me and don't abuse my trust or my service standard. I need to make sure that those people will come to me so I'm not driving over the country. Standard. As standard, you give me a call for, to get a meeting, yeah, um, I'll pass you on to Sonia and she'll let you know when I can see you. I only work certain days seeing clients, two days a week, now it was three and a half back then. So as standard, these are my client days. That's how I can best serve you and also enjoy this life that was given to me. This is where my, my health, my joy, my happiness, my wealth all came from. And people began to accept that. There's one little thing I want to just say in terms of the magic that happened. All the people that became clients of mine, both in the wealth management business and in my personal development business, my coaching business, they were there before, but they didn't see me. And it's interesting that the ones you set your standards, set out your stall, as it were, at a certain place, people that didn't see you before begin to see you. And what happened for me, they turn up in such great numbers, I then had to get other people to help me service those clients. And that's the magic of setting and living by standards. People, whether you talk it metaphysically or whether they just pick up something different about you, or they begin to respect you more because mm. you respect whatever it is, it's all of those things and more. When we set and live by daily standards, people notice it. And they will engage you on an unconscious level and allow you to serve them in numbers that you could never have worked out before. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's part of, um, you know, if, if you look at anyone who, mm. you know, is you can see when somebody's glowing, somebody yeah, feels yeah. happy, yeah. they look happy, they feel happy, it, mm. you know, it comes through their eyes. Indeed. It comes through their expression. So I yeah, assume yeah. kind of your mm. standards as well. So if you're happy with your standards yeah, and yeah. yourself yeah. and then, you know, your values, uh, yeah. it's going to come across in any and everything you do Indeed, and yeah. anybody yeah. and everybody you engage with. Yeah. And it's also the authentic piece as well, isn't it? Because I don't know how we know, but we know when someone's being authentic. Hmm. So it's a really funny thing. I was, I've always been an honest person. But when I wasn't doing very well, people probably think picking up unconsciously, oh, it's, it's, not, it's not the guy. Hmm. It's not him. Okay, that seems right and the advice seems right. But it's not the guy. And they weren't thinking this. They were just getting it fairly unconsciously. Very quickly, once I'd woken up, I can only say this as if by magic, hmm. <laughs> something inside of them was the recognising something inside of me and just going, he's the guy. Hmm. Well, it's, yeah. this, it's this guy. Yeah. And I think that's what happens in life, whether it be in relationships or in business, because it's really the same thing, isn't it? It's all about relationships, trusting and liking and understanding and that connection. When you get that, people just go, I need somewhere to plug into, someone I can trust, someone I can deal with in my loving relationship or in my business relationship. Every single one of us is looking for somewhere to plug into. Now, if we can hold that space by being authentic ourselves, people will plug into us in numbers where we're going to, we're going to work out how we're going to cope with these numbers. Thank you. Um, I was part of the research, as you said, that you're doing is, mm. is you're, you're, you're looking into companies and organizations mm. and, and reviewing kind of, you know, their standards and yeah. how they keep their standards and how they work with customers. Indeed. Can you tell me, can you share a little bit about that, please? Yeah, because when I began to, I mean, I had a small practice and I became a bigger practice, but still a relatively small business. Um, when I wrote the, the first book, I, uh, the, no, the 10 second philosophy, part of which is around how to review and set new standards. It's also around about how to be your true self, which is key to your authentic piece. And that's where people turn up. That, that's, that's the fact. But I also began to look at large brands that have got this right. So over the last um, uh, seven to eight years now, uh, and I, I picked up on some brands, Porsche, uh, AXA, uh, Disney, Marriott. And these were firms, organizations uh, that had rebranded themselves to become what we call standards-based companies. So you know, their, their strap line for, for Porsche, for example, maintaining standards, AXA, 
spent a huge amount of money rebranding the whole of their business model worldwide, including their um, strap lines. They're all their business, which is redefining standards. Disney and Chrysler, the other one I meant to mention, Disney and Chrysler were uplifting standards and upholding standards, respectively. And when I realised that those those firms were recognising the value of the daily delivery of their standard, they're being in that place, in the space that they operate in, and saying that if, we, if we're here, that's where the world would engage us. So I began to research that to bring it to you know, an S, you know, the SME world. So the, the SME world would then go, OK, we haven't got to spend you know, 10 or 100 million rebranding ourselves. What are the lessons of going within? So if we're an individual, we look inside and say, what are the, what are the right standards for me to live my life? If we're a corporate, big or small, we say, what are we here for? How are we to, what, we go inside ourselves and go, what's wrong? what are the right standards for us to operate our business by, by the day? Having a great goal for the future is great and it serves, but it's how we live by the day, how we live by the day, how we engage by the day that changes. So I began to work with these companies, did some work on and reported on them in the first book, and then now I'm doing a, a great piece, which is doing much more research through those companies with their permission uh, for the second book to see literally how do these multi-billion pound organisations, what do standards mean to them? What have they learned and got that the SME can actually, if they can increase their business by that much, how much can SME evolve by by taking on the concept of standards? See, then what they, all these firms have told me, it's not just about the goal. There's a missing link to true success. There's even a missing link to goal success. It's the daily operation standards that you live by. From the engagement to the quality of the paper, to the structure, how you engage the service, everything counts. Everything counts every single day, but only one day at a time. So they operate by doing, let's serve this way today. So I'm doing uh, more research with them. They've been very um, incredibly accommodating um, to allow me to look at how they got to that place, the journey that they went on. So the second book will be around standards, around how those firms got that and got to that space. And I'm going to take that message and the how-to to deliver it to the SMEs um, all around the world. To find out more about our latest projects, Get a free coaching lesson or download my book. Go to www.bernardo-moya.com. And that's part of what I find interesting is obviously is, is not only how you can share that information mm. with SMEs and companies mm. regarding you know how these big organizations keep and maintain and improve their standards, mm. but also I suppose what's important as a, as a small SME is is how do you how do you transfer or engage with your employees mm. to transfer these standards? Absolutely. Because that's, yeah, that's yeah. got to be the message is, okay, we have standards, this is what we stand by, but mm. how do you get mm. your people yeah. to live you know, yeah. uh, on the standard uh, basis? Well, I think one of the first things that when we talk with the organisations now, um, one of the first things that we do is about engagement. So who do you engage with first? Your customer or client base or your prospective clients or the people within the business? And the first engagement is, is obviously in, internally. So recognising and those people. And the, the, as, a, as a firm, a recruitment firm um, in, in the city of London um, that we did some work with, that kind of picked up the book um, ad hoc and then gave me some great feedback what they were doing. And they were working on, on an individual basis within their teams. And they're now opening an operation in New York as well, November last year, um, working within their teams to help people to identify what the right standards for their job were. Not giving them the KPIs and saying, here's what you must do, and everyone has the same, but we know you, let's learn a bit more about you. What's the right standard that would help you to serve in that role even better? That's when you get the buy-in, that's when you get the agreement, because you're now doing it with that person, not telling them what to do. So they now have their team meetings each morning, individual meetings around standards and what standard of behaviour. So you can't determine what the outcome of your business endeavours are that day, but you can determine the standards of which you operate at that day, even down to how many phone calls, what's reasonable, that's what's fair and what's the right standard. Well, no, you can't control the outcome, but you can make 16 calls today because you, you can pick up the phone that number of times. So we can engage the people is part one. And once you engage the people and you, and you have them understand the importance of that piece, they then help you to bring the message to your customer base because they're the ones that serve. If you're the CEO of a company, you're not really the one that serves, with respect. <laughs> your so people right. do the service. They need to engage in, in all of this. And the same when we did this for, did a workshop for um, a very large national care home um, for a bunch of their senior managers from around the country. And when we went through the standards piece, the people knew the right standards that they should have. Right from the smell test, 
when you walk into a care home or in a hospital, you do the smell test. And if you have if you have that smell when you walk into an a, 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 an old folks home or a hospital, and you and the wrong smell, a standard has been missed somewhere. Standard hasn't been hit, or maybe more than one. So you do the tests for what's called breaching standards, and you kind of breach the standards. So if you if you do that smell test, you go some standard isn't being met somewhere because that isn't the smell. That isn't what it should be. So they, these people then came to me and just said, look, we actually do know this stuff, but it hasn't been on our agenda. It's not been part of the narrative. Can we get, can you do this program for the directors? <laughs> so they can then, because you know, we, we have to follow these rules, but if we can get this stuff to the directors, so they were shifting from within, because they got it. And if you work within a big organisation, you talk about standards, your people will get it. It's then about how we get that from narrative to action and we get to serve more people. We get the honour of serving more people because the goodwill part comes when the public begins to recognise you as a standards-based company. Everyone wants to work with an organisation that's perceived to have high standards and that does have high standards. And we'll pay more, we'll pay a premium for that. Absolutely. I mean, with the others. Absolutely. Yeah. So what would you say your, your best assets are now uh, as an individual, apart um, from having... Good and high standards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's um, apart from my my wife and children. They genuinely yeah, are. You know, absolutely. I put that in, in in the book. You know, I literally owe everything to them. And and by the way, they they stuck with me, <laughs> wife and kids through all that trauma and not being much of my true self and the downs and the bad years and the financial disasters. Um, so that, that's number one off off the scale. It's off that. It's the people uh, around me, the team of people I, I have that work with me to help deliver the message. But you know what? The if you then go to to the me thing, what's important is that I'm willing to recognise that whether you believe in God, the universe, whatever, that this life was given to me. So as long as I can live my authentic self through my life today, just for today. That's my biggest asset, the willingness to be my authentic self. When the world and the newspapers and the media are saying, don't be yourself, be like this, conform, wear these clothes, speak this way, don't you dare say that because people wouldn't like it. And, and I don't know about you, but um, I used to live in a place where I used to control my actions based on what I thought people thought of me. <laughs> and I was in disaster, you know, because you can't live like that. So my biggest asset actually is my willingness to be my authentic self and to live from that place, because that's where the magic happens for all of us. Thank you. Uh, and what do you think uh, you're looking at now, mm. kids coming out of schools, mm. universities, or people trying to find a new job? Mm. What do you think the best assets are? What, what should people be looking for? What should they be doing? Yeah, actually, it's a really simple answer to that question, but there is, a, there is another question that it throws up. We'll give the answer first, and then we'll give the other question. The answer is authenticity. Yeah. Anyone that works in business and particularly in sales, people are buying authenticity now. But there's a little thing that's out there somewhere in the world that says, you know, fake it till you make it. Well, I faked it for a number of years and I didn't make it. <laughs> now, and people would smell that in the and people go on course now to learn how to be authentic. Come on. Now you've got to just be authentic. Learn how to be truly authentic rather than faking it. Because that's the asset that you bring into any business meeting. That's the asset that you bring into any interview where the employee goes, you know what, this guy here or this young lady here, um, not as qualified as the other candidates, um, hasn't got the same experience, hasn't done the work experience, but you know what? Something about her, isn't there? And they tell you what that something is. Something inside of them is picking up something inside of that young lady or that young, young chap and going, it's them. It doesn't matter if they're the right person, we can work with all the rest. That's the biggest asset to bring into any meeting, any relationship, you know, any, any interview, if you're going for an interview for, you know, for a job in today's world, leaving school. Um, people want authentic selves. And a lot of the times, the interviewers, the companies, don't even know that they want it. But when they feel it, they recognise, we should have this. And you get the job when you're the, probably the third or fourth or fifth most qualified person to get it, but you get it because the thing that counted the most is the authenticity and everyone knows people buy authenticity even when they don't recognise that that's what they're buying. They're buying it. If you're coming out of school, college, mm -hmm. and you're trying to make some money, what's your mm -hmm. advice? I mean, um, yeah. you provide people advice. Well, yeah, on, yeah. I, I on give people advice on, on, on wealth. And, you know, if you're coming out of school and first thing you know, if you've, if you've got a job, um, then absolutely is, um, you know, the basics, you know, uh, keep some money for yourself, you know. And, uh, and put some money into one of th one of three pots. You know, the pot that says it's short term, the pot that says this is my long term, and the pot that says it's my opportunity money. And the opportunity pot, you know, those two taken care of. The opportunity pot says, uh, in my, as my authentic self, and as I learn what's going on in the world, 
doesn't matter whether you're you know, 18 or 28 or 38 or 50, it doesn't matter. As learn what's going on in the world, I have a pot of money that I can invest in this opportunity. The opportunity may be you, as in I can go on a course and learn some NLP, because I realize that's a massive asset to have, and that's spoken in every language around the world. So I need to know that this stuff, so I can invest, invest in NLP courses and teachings. That's something else that, that, that you can, and that's the most by my own uh, children are doing that. My son's been on NLP courses, he's just left university and got a job um, with a company, I might mention the name, it doesn't matter the name of the company, but a very, very big company. I'm very proud of him. Um, and he got, got a job where actually they created the job for him because of how he came across in the interview, even though he wasn't predicting, he wasn't predicting the degree that they really wanted for that job. He got the interview because of how his CV looked, the books he'd read, the course he'd gone on and how he came across. And then they said to him, we've got something else for you. You can do something else. And having an NLP background at the age of 21 was a, was a really useful thing to do. So invest in yourself. The opportunity fund includes not investing in a business opportunity necessarily, but investing in yourself with the best technologies, with the best you know, philosophies to work. Therefore, you can help the world in a better place and a greater place from that place. So it's maybe not you expecting as an answer, but it is to me the answer. is about how do we help young people, in fact anyone, 29 or, tw- or 92, oh. to be the authentic self, because it's so rare, and this is a massive message from the book, when you get to this place, it's so rare, when people see it, they recognise it, and they say, I want to be part of that. If it means giving you a job, or being in a relationship with you, whatever it is, people say, I want a part of that. And then they figure out how to become part of you. How can we change the job description so this guy can have it? Yeah. How do I position myself so I can be in a relationship with this guy or this girl? This is the important stuff. We're all searching for that. So there are no new answers. The answer is the same all the way through. And but that's part of the thing, I, I suppose, really, is, is that um, we tend to invest a lot of money in a new suit, new pair of shoes, and, uh, mm. and obviously the latest uh, Xbox or whatever, but yeah. we tend to not prioritize all oh, the new phone, but we don't tend mm. to prioritize in investing in ourselves and upgrading our software. Yeah. And education yeah, yeah. is kind of key, and obviously yeah. that's what we're involved in. Indeed. Uh, so how important yeah. is for you learning mm. and education? And, uh, wow. Yeah. I was about to say it's everything, but you know, it's uh, not as important as life. You know, but <laughs> being above ground is a good start. But you know what? To, to me, education is really around not just what you can take on, but what you can learn about yourself. Because I genuinely believe that um, the life I'm living right now and how I'm helping people around the world with the philosophy and the teaching and the, and the standards um, piece, which is pretty much now in every continent. I haven't spoken in Africa yet, but everywhere else I have, and over the other continents. And what I really realise that... The educational piece is how to learn what's already inside you. So the world takes you as a child and then it allows you to play for a while. And then it says to you, be like this. And be like this until you've left university. And then you spend the next 60 odd years trying to deconstruct what the world made of you to find who you really are. The biggest education for all of us is to go inside and discover who we really are and use tools and courses and programs that help us to do one thing, discover our inner genius. Because we all, we all have that and we can get that out. We will then find the way. We will then be on the right path for ourselves. And there's not a course in the world that is outside of you they can do any better than one that teaches you how to discover who you are. The best course would help you discover who you are, how you are, your gifts, your abilities, and to get those into the world. That's the second bit. It must be, don't just discover. Don't just get there and go up some mountain in an orange robe and sit there and discover and be fully aware. That's great. Get what you learn into the world. Make a difference in the world with that which you now know and change the world. Maybe your world or maybe literally the world gets changed because of what you now know. Of, of your so the first education is self-education i.e. education of self bringing out what's already there and there are tools which we know with courses and programs that can help to do that that's how i changed my life that's how i've helped people around the world to change their lives it's about l- helping to learn how to go inside discover your gifts and then to get them out in a practical way they can if you want to pay your bills or if you want to help I, I know that through this process people will come up with stuff that will change the world Literally, you know, it won't be me. But if I can work to work, if I can work, sorry, to wake up someone else and their genius changes the world, I mean, what more could you ask? Agreed. Yeah. And my last question, uh, mm-hmm. Derek, what would you like your legacy to be in many, many years from now? My legacy uh, would be he started this. 
I don't mean that from an egoic point. I mean that the legacy is that I have no idea what the standards revolution, the whole thing around standards, instead of just living by God, by daily standards, we call the standards revolution. And that's where it started. The legacy is to begin to help people to live their life by daily standards set from within. That's where the authentic peace comes in. And that's it. Because what I do know, if I can help people during my short time here to live in this way, then they will help other people in their short time here to live in this way, to live happy on that journey, to be authentic and to live by standards that serve them and help them to serve others. Nothing more than that. I guess that's why I'm here. I guess you are. Yeah. <laughs> Terry, thanks very much. That was Pleasure, Bernardo. Thank you. Thanks very Pleasure. much. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching Inspiring People. Thanks, Terry. That was Cheers. great. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co.